Well, maybe we'll get started and we'll allow people to join us as we go along. So welcome to this, which is the fourth in our seminar series on using mass observations, COVID-19 collections, which is really a seminar series, partly about mass observation, partly about life in the COVID-19 pandemic, partly about diaries, partly about other qualitative methods, um, and it has some support from the British Academy. I'm one of the organisers, along with my colleague Clive Barnett and also Jessica Scantlebury and Kirsty Patrick, two of the archivists at the Mass Observation Archive that many of you know. Um, in the last session, just before summer, if you can cast your minds back, um, we have three papers about, um, well, from people doing research using mass observations, COVID-19 collections, looking at things like mental health, time and temporality, fear, among other things. Um, and for anyone interested, there's a video of that session now available on Mass Observations YouTube channel. In today's session, we're very pleased to have three more papers from researchers using Mass Observations COVID-19 collections. Perpetua Kirby and Rebecca Webb, Annabella Pollen and Kirsty Patrick. So I'll hand over to Perpetua and Rebecca in a moment, but just before I do that, to remind everyone of the format, um, We'll ask each speaker or set of speakers to speak for approximately 20 minutes. Um, we'll move straight from one talk to the next, and then hopefully we'll have about an hour or so for questions, discussion, and so on at the end of the session. Um, just so you're all aware, we're recording the talks. Um, we won't record the discussion afterwards, but we're recording the talks and we'll stick them up on Mass Observations YouTube channel um, in the next few days or next week or two um, and join the talks can I ask everyone to turn their mics off um, please feel free to use the chat um, write comments for each other you can write questions for the speakers and we can pick those up um, in the second hour of the session um, in the second hour of the session hopefully we'll also be able to use the raise hand function and give everyone an opportunity to speak as well so, um, Perpetua and Rebecca, are you ready to kick us off? Thank you, we are, we are. Yeah. We'll just share our screen. Can everybody see that? Just going to um, okay. go down so I can put it on full view. So for it's got the, it's got the, um, it's got the zoom instructions at the bottom, so I can't click it on full view. How do I get rid of that? Hang on, I've got to move it. Here we go, here we go. There we go. Great. Okay, uh, Perpetua and I are delighted to be with you today. Um, we are both from the Centre of Innovation and Research in Childhood and Youth at the University of Sussex, which is a university-wide research centre. Um, so it's interdisciplinary and its primary focus is on children and young people and innovative and creative research methods that really illuminate their place in the world. And particularly it's about really problematizing times when they disappear from view and really asserting their voice and participation. And uh, we, our work together, Rebecca and I, we work on a number of things together and our focus is really about um how we oh yeah how we educate for uncertainty and our work uh it comes under the bed heading of transforming education and this is really addressing sort of dominant technical education dis discourses uh that are current globally that emphasize certainty rather than opening up spaces of un children and young people to engage with uncertainty and uh, this piece of work is based on the premise that a pandemic uh, requires uh, critical, you know, critical uh, civil society and creative civil society to address with life's, to address life's uncertainties. 
But in the pandemic, we're sort of exploring the extent to which uncertainty was really left to children and parents and families, uh, rather than seen as an educational issue. And we had uh, a master's student who really captured for us the, the sort of the difficulty of uh, an education that emphasizes certainty and doesn't allow spaces of uncertainty when she said the bubble of uncertainty begins to crack as we're on the edge of being poured into real life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so to extend, um, the, if you like, a framing device for the piece of research that we conducted with the Mass Observation Archive, um, we wanted to talk just a little bit more about our wider re research and the way it informs um, our focus. Um, so we, we consider, we really concerned and consider the idea of what are the purposes of education, particularly schooling, current schooling, globalised schooling. Um, we notice uh, that it's very much about a range of what we call conforming ideas, conforming practices and pedagogies, very much about qualifications, very much about particular forms of socialisation in, into an educational sphere and indeed into the wider world. But our research is very much concerned with, whilst this is going on, thinking about what are the, also the possibilities for what we, for transformation, for different modes of sub subjectification. Um, and we think about this as different forms of possibilities for knowing differently, doing differently, being differently, and constantly come the possibility of being other than what one is at that current moment. Uh, we're particularly informed by theorists uh, Jacques Rancière and the work of Gert Biester. Uh, and Gert Biester is very much a, an educational philosopher concerned with these ideas. But we're also very much informed with the, and I know we've got colleagues here doing wonderful work in this area, around the research around what does COVID say about young people's well-being? And what we're, we're thinking about is how does there's a huge focus on well-being, but how does this translate well into the educational sphere? And what, what does this say about the educational demands of the school? Okay, so this means that our research questions for this particular um, little project have been these. How, how does the young diarist writing engage with uncertainty of COVID and lockdown in 2020? Sorry, Rebecca, it's not moving. Oh, yeah, there it is. Um, so, so that was the first question. And what might this tell us about what children and young people need educationally in order to engage with uh, a life beyond school with life's wider uncertainties. So um, we examine the diaries and the young writing within that and what, they, what, the, what the writers give accent to in their writing in order to think about what this might tell us about how they express themselves and how they make their, write, their writing their own. So by engaging with the writing, we're thinking of it as similar to the experience of reading a poem as described by, in, by Eamon Dunn's work, which he identifies as a matter of the heart as well as the head. And it requires, he suggests, a reading between the lines that exposes us to uncertainty about what might be known, our own ignorance in the reading, as well as wonder. And to verify what we might know or say about the young people uh, as writing, we attend closely to the text in order to, as Barbara Johnson says, read what the language is doing, not guess what the author is thinking. Um, and that's what we try to do in our analysis to stick very much to the text. We come from a broadly interpretivist um, background and approach. Um, but also uh, echoing a pedagogy of uncertainty that we use as a tool for engaging with our wider research in the schools. Uh, for example, not coming to meaning too quickly or certainly um, and holding open a contingent space. And Rebecca, can you just um, do the sample? I'm just going to get my power lead. Yes, certainly. So the sample we, um, we looked there obviously out of the 
four, four and a half thousand lockdown diaries of all ages. Our focus was on those diaries that uh, looked concerned children between the age of four and 17. And we currently analysed 50 diaries in some depth. Um, and and, and as, as you know, the available information that we have on those very much concerns age, gender and location. Okay, so coming at the analysis as we do through uncertainty, we draw on the work of Ian Schoons and Andy Sterling in IDS at Sussex Institute of Development Studies, who are really working on the politics of uncertainty in the global south. And they identify the need to pay attention to different registers, four registers, which for them in their context speaks back to the developmental discourses that emphasize uh, fixing things. But for us, we find them productive in our own work as well. So with the analysis, we start by coding the uh, writing in using these four codes, uh, plus a code that uh, is just about all references to schooling and schoolwork. And we're interested in how these registers feature, to what extent they feature, and what they might or might not be telling us. So we, in the analysis, the focus has really become on practices and materiality and the existential and the ethical. And we found that the knowledge and the effective and embodiment are freighted through these two dominant themes. And in the next, uh, uh, the next few slides, we're going to give examples that exemplify this, what this type of analysis produces. And then we conclude with the educational implications for these. I um, should add that we're also working with a colleague uh, who looked at children's writings at a very similar time, the first lockdown, globally. And, we, and it seems that what's coming out is, is sort of applying across these different contexts, the sorts of themes we're identifying. Okay. So um, the first thing that we're going to focus on in terms of the, the, the data that emerged for us from the diaries is what we're calling everyday practices that relates to the work of um, and, uh, Ian Schoons that Perpetua mentioned before. And the, the diaries are very much infused with multiple examples of very embodied practices that offer opportunities to engage uh, playfully, physically, creatively in and around the home in that time of lockdown. Um, includes playing games, crafting, listening to music, cooking and eating, gardening, walking, cycling, exercising, and attending to both the human and the non-human in the outdoors and using technologies to keep in touch with friends. And this, this example really captures that beautifully. And if you don't mind, I might just read it. So it's from a 10 year old female. In the morning, the first thing I saw as I looked was really amazing. Out the window was a truck lifting up the old deserted car on my road. My heart was beating fast because I thought the machine was going to drop it on our car. I'm not making this up, trust me. So after all that excitement, I had to sit at the table to do my schoolwork. A hundred sums and English questions later. I'd finished my work for the day. Then I went outside in my garden to play football. I would go to the park. But because of lockdown, we're only allowed out once a day and the park is too busy and not that essential. After about an hour, we came back inside and started making chocolate brownies for my birthday in three days. We made them specially because I love them and they're fun to bake. I was really excited. We let them bake and cool down and then the rest of the day was free time and we played and talked to my auntie from a distance, which is one of my favourite times of the day. So the emphasis um, in the writing of these practices is very often on the value placed on time spent with loved ones, including family celebrations. Um, and a slow attention to one's locale, as well as a careful navigation of COVID mandates and all that follows from this, such as where to play, how to keep in contact with others. And cooking and food is frequently mentioned in the writing, evoking, as it does in this example, the relational and the social as well as the sensory. Um, 
The diaries we analyse convey an engagement with their limited range of home practices. What makes them worthy of note, however, is that they narrate with multiple tenors of effective affiliations, maintaining sort of contradictions and tensions at one of the same time. Often lots of them talk about sort of uh, tensions in the family, for example. So feelings are evoked, of, often in rich descriptive language about family relationships, sensory engagements with everyday worlds, and being at home appears to facilitate a different relationship with time, offering the possibility for contemplation, contemplation and noticing a whole gamut of feelings, sometimes those that compete sitting alongside one another. So this might include the pleasures of more time at home, while also acknowledging boredom and the difficulties of being without friends in the extended family, such as the loss of sociability of school and time with friends at home, in parks, shops, in sports halls and birthday parties. The expression of su such activities, however, almost invariably in the diaries we've looked at, contrasts with schoolwork, which is often presented as though in parenthesis and therefore necessary but rather somewhat unwelcome and we see how young people can make the shifts between the different modes of the domestic and of schoolwork. So to continue this theme of everyday practices um, in the collection, there are frequent references to schoolwork undertaken at home, and the descriptors deployed are often truncated using quite sort of technicist and rational language rather than evoking an, an effective encounter. For example, often the writing suggests an engagement only with what we've called earlier on conforming school practices and students' own efforts to fit in with teacher expectations. Many offer a muted and denuded reference to schooling and schoolwork practices. A frequent, but not the only, evocation is of a description of schoolwork that draws on a recognition of school as a space of rather dull and repetitive activities. The example here repeats the emphasis on a hundred sons. There's quite a lot of humour in that too. Um, they tend to the pressure of sticking at school, of not falling behind or else keeping one step ahead comes through strongly in the writing, as you can see in those examples. This emphasis nullifies what it means to learn because the currency of education, it's always deferred to the future with a promise of something, some sort of citizenship to come. The student in the second quote writes about the cancellation of the English national exams, GCSEs, leaves her feeling cheated as if the previous five years have become worthless without the examination and other markers of, of this particular transition. And in, in the samples of writing, only one example, this quote, quote three that we have up here is, is given of teachers offering explicit support to navigate the vicissitudes of the uh, lockdown. These types of motivational messages illustrate the constant call within schools to improve oneself and to get onto the next rung of the meritocratic ladder. Such messages might be powerful in the hands of inspirational figures, um, for example, but schools have become littered with such slogans disconnected from the embodied and relational practices that foster community resilience. Uh, the writing expresses how such messages can be experienced as a metaphor metaphorical tightening of the ratchet. Such hollowed out reiterations of meritocratic, merit meritocratic, Meritocracy served to emphasize, identified by Michael Sandel, that we are responsible for our fate and deserve what we get, which in turn erodes solidarity and demoralizes those left behind by globalization. The student in this third example conveys a feeling of having slipped to the minds of her teachers and the anxiety of the certainty of the education contract 
annulled. We're just going to take um, one example of one student to look at, to sort of to illustrate really the existential and ethical concerns that came through in the writing. So the writing, a lot of the writing grapples with existential questions of life and death and what this means of how to live. And there's mention, for example, of relatives having been affected, concerns about infecting others, and um, described here as the drowning fear um, of passing on the virus. There's also uh, very much an engagement in the collection uh, of the writing with the existential and ethical concerns that take the writing beyond the immediacy of the individuated lives and desires of the, of the young people. In a pandemic context that emphasizes the interconnection of human risk of illness, the, the, the writing highlights multitude of examples of ethical attention to others and community cohesion. And there's an appreciation of the importance of protecting others including display and, and displays of gratitude for NHS and other key workers, as well as individual acts of kindness. And these evoke very much the spirit of the nation and belonging in a community. And these are for a hopeful engagement with the uncertainty of the pandemic. In England, the National Weekly Clapping for the NHS with everyone in it together created a euphoric sense of nationalism, although that later became followed by a more critical discourse of who was excluded. But this became entangled with the well-worn tropes of British nationalism, and particularly the Second World War victory, rather than broader ways of being. So the 15-year-old here goes on to describe um, well, she describes the, uh, the, v, the, you know, the VE Day celebrations uh, and, and the wartime songs, and she mentions Captain Tom, who raised money for the NHS. So it feels as if in the absence of alternative visions, there's a retreat often into the well-known and the familiar. Hope is found in historical victories, but also it's found in the conforming knowledge of science. Uh, both in the hope of discovering a vaccine, but also in the uh, emphasis on PPE and social distancing practices. Um, uh, and at times the writing takes on a rather moralizing polarity about what people should or should not do in the rate of response to the pandemic. Um, for example, one says, I know for a fact that some people here don't take lockdown seriously, still going to parties and meeting up. It feels like they're half of the reason why we're getting so, it's getting so bad and lockdown is lasting so long. And uh, the overriding desire that comes through is the that of returning to normal, whilst also fears and concerns about the uncertainty of the new normal. And there's no questioning in the writing at all that we've spotted about whether what is considered normal might be reimagined or indeed uh, uh, whether it is wholly desirable. And what is also missing is any reference to scriptures, philosophy or other texts that might have something to offer. Uh, including the types of dominant themes and, and religions to the ethics of communitarianism. I'm going to move on to just the final slide. So um, these are just a few examples, but draw sort of trying to explore what this means for education. And so the what we're sort of exploring is how might it suggest that moments of opening possibilities for students to engage with uncertainty in school whilst not ignoring the conformity uh, needs of the curriculum, what this might shift for students and enable for them to be and do in any moment. So um, moments that are not focused on curriculum outputs where the student must only listen to what the teacher knows and demonstrates their knowledge through a prescriptive memory recall. So for example, um, we're currently working with a group in Brighton where we are asking children to identify objects, to go out and attend slowly and carefully to their worlds, if you like, and to identify objects that say something to them about their local sustainability issues. And then they're swapping those objects with young people in Ecuador and India who are currently experiencing climate change. Um, and, uh, and it's a sort of, what, what does this make possible? What does it shift? What does it say about who they are and what the world requires of them? 
The other is to really reignite and sort of reinvite the what has been currently marginalised from the curriculum, such as cooking, gardening, and crafting, uh, that offer a possibility uh, for more effect, effective practices and engagements. And also how to support an engagement in the existential, where they might explore the tensions between different forms of knowledge, for example, whether that's the scientific and indigenous, um, and where they might draw on different texts, whether philosophical, literary, um, spiritual, to explore what alternative narratives might be available to, to, to foster a sort of hope in the present uh, and what is possible now. And uh, similarly, valuing the use of creative practices uh, or just in terms of the, the scientific is, for example, maybe engaging 12 to 15 year olds and really thinking about the vaccine. So they identify and verify different sources of information and then deliberate those so that they can make informed choices themselves about whether they get vaccinated. And lastly, valuing creative practices to really explore anxieties, the affective, um, uh, so um, to uh, explore uh, their own vulnerabilities and, and, and foreground them because we know they are there. We know, for example, about climate change, children are deeply concerned, but where are the spaces within school to actually engage with those um, and, and to do that using more creative deliberative practices. Great. Thank you. I'm, I'm a little bit, we're a little bit over, but we started a bit late, so we hope that's not too much over. Might be, sorry. <laughs> no, it's absolutely fine. Thank you very much, Perpetua and Rebecca. Um, people feel free to use the chat, but what we're going to do is shift straight from that paper to Annabella's paper. So I don't know if uh, you all want to switch your screens over. I'll say while Annabella just pulls up her screen yeah. that. Um, I particularly liked uh, the, the way in that last paper, um, the theme of uncertainty was pulled through from thinking about uncertainty in education to thinking about how you approach the mass observation material methodologically and, and, and when, when doing interpretation. I thought that was, that was really nice. Okay, Annabella, over to you. Can you hear me okay? And can you see my slides okay? Yes and yes. Great. Thank you very much. Um, very happy to be part of this seminar. That was a really interesting presentation to follow. So um, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me. Um, if, yeah, I'll begin by talking about the slide uh, and the title very briefly. So I've given my talk the title, There's Nothing Less Spectacular Than a Pestilence. It's a quote from Albert Camus' 1947 novel, The Plague in order to introduce some of the challenges and the complexities of visualizing and depiction, depicting COVID-19 in general, and in particular in mass observations, COVID collections. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to introduce some context for my approach to the collection material. And then I'm gonna draw on some particular examples from the collections for interpretation. Um, for those who don't know me, by way of a quick introduction, I've been interested in mass observation for some time. I signed up briefly as a contributor in the 1990s, and then I returned as a postgraduate researcher in the 2000s, and I was a research fellow in 2009-2010 on a University of Brighton project called Methodological Innovations Using Mass Observation which resulted in a couple of journal articles about MO and research methods. But in the same decade, I was doing a PhD on a history of photography subject and specifically on this collection using material that's in mass observations related collections, specifically the 55,000 amateur photographs, all taken on one day in 1987 for a charity fundraising competition, which was entitled One Day for Life. And that attempted to depict everyday life in Britain through the prism of a single day using mass participation photography as its tool. 
Um, this project wasn't originated by MO, but the collection was acquired by then director Dorothy Sheridan in the early 1990s. And she perceived it as a photographic parallel to MO's interest in everyday life and amateur documentary, and especially its single day viewpoint, which echoed the May the 12th day diaries of 1937 and beyond. Um, so my analysis of that collection, which I um, later published in a book about mass participation photography more broadly, has unexpectedly come to be of use in COVID times, because as the pandemic took hold in Britain in spring 2020, participatory or sometimes called crowdsourced photography projects began to reemerge as um, a force uh, in force rather as a means to create connections between communities to record a historical moment characterized as unprecedented and to capture the strange new sites and to externalize the complex emotions that the new conditions precipitated. And one prominent example of that organized by the National Portrait Gallery and um, headed by um, Kate Middleton was entitled Hold Still, a portrait of our nation in 2020 that had remarkable similarities to the One Day for Life project and outcome, um, including a best-selling book of um, a small subsection of the overall images submitted. Although this project emerged without reference to its predecessors, everything from the royal figurehead, the large numbers of amateur contributors, over 30,000 photos were sent in, um, the charitable dimension, Profits Go to Mind, and the emotional register all shared characteristics with One Day for Life. And another project picturing lockdown organised by Historic England uh, made a nationwide appeal for photographs during um, a two week period over the end of April, beginning of May 2020. Now, this project did reference mass observation in its publicity explicitly as its point of departure. And for this project, over 3000 photographs were received and 100 were selected to enter Historic England's photographic archive. Now, with this project, like with One Day for Life, I've had access to the full collection of all the submissions as I've been part of a team of researchers commissioned by Historic England to evaluate the project and its, um, its, it, it, its photographs. Picturing lockdown, I'm just showing you a sample here of a very small selection of submissions and again here. Um, it usefully shows the visual repertoire of COVID, as I call it, um, particularly as it was emerging in the early weeks of lockdown. Repetitive photographic subjects seen in the collection include home haircuts, sourdough bread, empty streets, PPE, clapping and rainbows. And together these constitute the visible practices and symbols that are now part of a kind of recognisable COVID culture. I'm not going to linger more over those projects as my focus is on MO's COVID collections and within them contributors particular use of and reference of the visual. But before I get to some of that material, there are some other contexts that I wanted to highlight regarding mass observation and visual culture more generally before I move on to some examples. So while mass observation has looking and seeing implicit in its title and while photography and painting were employed as part of the organization's original research methods, mass observation materials are not predominantly visual in form. Writing is central in both phases and a few scholars, as a few scholars of mass observations, visual culture and visual material have affirmed. So on the left, I'm showing you um, the leaflet from Russell Roberts's curated mass observation exhibition at the Photographer's Gallery from 2013. And on the right, Lucy Curzon's book from 2017, I think it is. And photographs in particular form an absent presence across mass observation where they move in and out of view as material subject matter and metaphor. In some recent writing that I've been preparing for a forthcoming edited collection, I've been looking back at the centrality of the image as a key literary concept in early mass observation writings and at the way that correspondents were characterised as cameras, 
even though very little photographic material was produced. Obviously, um, Humphrey Spender's work down photographs are a key exception to this. And there's some examples here about how Madge and Harrison are characterizing observers as cameras, talking about what they're trying to capture in mass observation as being this um, concept of the image, this particular kind of mass image. And for that chapter, um, which I've put the title of here, um, I've also looked at directives from 2012 about photography to see how correspondence to the post-1981 mass observation project write about images. And overall, I'm arguing that there's a very particular mass observation way of seeing and way of writing that is imagistic, if not ekphrastic. If you're familiar with that term, it's um, a poetic term to describe a particular genre of writing, poetry that describes art in its most literal sense, but in an expanded sense, a particular kind of vivid writing that um, evokes images in the mind's eye. So, um, those wider cu cultures of crowdsourced COVID photography projects and the sometimes marginal status of the visual in mass observation material have shaped how I've sampled the COVID submissions. And most literally, I looked at visual material that was submitted with or as diaries. Um, and I looked across um, this particular selection. So I've looked at around in detail at around 75 of the May the 12th diaries and at uh, 44 of diaries by other non-mass observers. And this particular sample includes photographs taken by correspondents documenting their lockdown experiences, for example, in this selection of home baking, home exercising, um, outdoor containment in park and gardens, even meeting in the bottom right, um, the public art challenge. This is a haddock, piece of haddock on a slim phone that is a reinterpretation of Salvador Dali's famous lobster telephone surrealist artwork. Some contributors submitted extraordinary original illustrations. This is an example of a diary that is entirely visual, a coronavirus alphabet diary. Um, and many others um, repurposed images or made screen grabs from TV, news, social media, sometimes adding new commentary. This is an image from HBO's uh, Chernobyl TV series that has been kind of refashioned with a new title. But um, submissions that included images are definitely in the minority. So I also looked for the visual in writing in relation to my argument that Emo's writing is particularly imagistic, but also in relation to the peculiar complexities of COVID's visibility. Because COVID has been popularly described as hard to see. Donald Trump, for example, in March 2020, characterized the virus as an invisible enemy. And Boris Johnson has repeatedly used similar terms describing coronavirus as an unexpected and invisible mugger. So if COVID is invisible, I want to consider how it manifests visually, how it might be visualized in the experiences of those writing for MO, how do they illustrate it literally, how do they capture it in written images, and what might be distinctive about seeing COVID in the mass observation project. So many who did not include visual materials spoke about COVID's particular visual dimensions, and it's to that material that I'm going to now focus in the second half of my presentation. So contributors or correspondents echoed politicians' language about visibility and invisibility in their writing. For example, in the foul year of our Lord 2020, I found myself confined to the house due to the invisible menace of coronavirus, says one. Another says, some of my friends think the whole thing's a conspiracy to control us. And it is strange staying inside when everything looks so normal out there. The May 12th diaries are particularly interesting on visibility as two days before that date, Boris Johnson had changed the lockdown status from stay at home to stay alert. And the nebulousness of that message and its relation to wartime slogans and to wartime practices was reflected on by correspondents especially among those who observed that qualities of vigilance and surveillance were characterizing COVID daily life. For example, over the last few days, I've been thinking about my grandparents, all of whom 
were alive in the Second World War. My grandfather was a fire watcher in London. And in the evenings, I've been thinking about how he kept watch over the city while others slept. I think about how quiet the roads must have been during the war and how dark the nights. In lockdown, the roads have been so quiet again and the government are telling us all to stay alert. Perhaps we are all watchers looking for the danger signs. And another says, Tesco has instituted a one-way system around the shop, informally policed by members of the public, who in another time and place would have been ARP wardens, or who would have shopped their neighbours to the secret police. Many writers isolated from the outside world looked instead at its photographic representation in news and social media, and the press image was a particular point of reflection for many again, especially in relation to surveillance. So here's three examples from one diarist who says, Facebook was flooded with pictures of the elderly, men and women stood with a basket in the middle of the store, glancing down at their shopping list with all the shelves around them empty with a bewildered look on their faces, sobering and sad, she says. And then she reflects on the images that she sees on BBC News and on Facebook of commuters or holiday makers packed together with no face coverings being worn and no social distance in place. Oh, have I gone too far there? Yeah. Several correspondents write about how their senses seem more attuned, for example, by hearing birdsong and not being sure if the birds are singing more loudly or whether they're simply noticing more. And that relates especially to um, the visual sense. One diarist says, how to keep one's heart from sinking on a daily basis. This spring will be remembered as the year we noticed our environment, seeing a sort of silver lining in that um, heightened sense. And a contributor who um, likes to paint in her spare time says, during these last seven weeks at home, I've not really been feeling much like painting. Instead, I've been watching. My gaze has been more intense, my focus longer. As I have been looking at nature and animals, I've moved into a very slow and quieter gear. I have had time to look and we've all had time to think. Um, and this might seem a rather privileged position. There are interestingly many MO correspondents who treat the pandemic as a spiritual retreat or as an artistic residency. Those are their terms. Um, and this might suggest that only those with spare time have this additional time to look. But interestingly, a particularly imagistic contribution comes from a busy ambulance driver who draws visual scenes of his work as tiny sketches. He says, for example, I was traveling back home in my car, which is plastered with NHS logos and badges. A white Audi went past me, which suddenly slowed down. And then the driver put on hazard lights to say thank you to me and raised the fists out of the window to salute. I waved back and the Audi sped off into the sunset like in old movies. Um, and this brings me to another sort of visual theme that emerges regularly. Several contributors draw photographic, painterly or filmic parallels in their observation of lockdown experience. Life under lockdown is more like a representation or a fantasy. It becomes rendered as an image rather than as reality. And an example here is like being in a film, this diarist says, or having a dream and expecting to wake up and then realising it's real and it's happening now. Dreams and fantasies, interestingly, were um, very much the original focus of mass observations, investigations, as were the shouts and gestures of motorists in the previous example. Um, and this has proved remarkably enduring, including in directives, um, as many of you will know, that solicit dream accounts. But in COVID diaries, too, reflections are volunteered on both night visions and on daydreams. So one diarist says, I'm enjoying my dream life, even though spiked with anxiety because they give me something to think about. Last night I dreamed I was sitting next to a man who smoked cigarettes, so I wasn't able to move away. I felt sick and I carried that over into wakefulness where it stayed with me, an unpleasant feeling of illness. And another says, my husband and I have fallen into the habit of both waking up at 4am and telling each other about our dreams. Everyone's having the most vivid dreams now. Normally, what we call garden variety anxiety, but sometimes the most bizarre images, like roller coasters, being the new method of transportation. She says, I dream a lot about being lost in cities or plane crashes, husband dreams of snakes. Um, and 
in terms of daydreams, um, one diary says, I wonder if anyone else's head is doing what mine is doing, replaying snatches of our good times all over the world. Usually tiny inconsequential times, sitting outside a fish restaurant, for example, in Italy, watching the sea, taking photos of himself with a huge bottle of wine, the ginger cat who followed us all over Plovdiv, Bulgaria. This was this time last year, will it ever happen again? She says, and another diary says, sometimes I imagine the act of being in a bookshop, leafing through pages, buying a book. Um, for a couple of final examples, I wanted to offer two very vivid scenes that capture the heightened intensities of experience under lockdown, and also the poetic descriptions that can populate imagistic mass observation writing. This is a longer piece from a 16 year old who's doing his GCSEs, um, they've been cancelled. He says, from my bedroom window, I look out across the little world I can see, the birds dancing, the trees swaying, a gentle landscape painting itself along the surface of the river. The road has gone silent for a few moments. In its place springs a concert of chirps and whistles floating along a soft breeze towards my window. I'm drawn to a row of yellow flowers over in the distant park whose brilliance is dazzling in the sunlight. Next to them, I notice the silhouette of an old man sitting alone on a park bench quietly representing the last trace of humanity in my view of the world. Gazing over to the boat club, I imagine dozens of people out on the courts, knocking back balls and knocking balls back and forth, spectators laughing from the sides as they sip their drinks, coaches giving lessons to lively children, elderly folk gathered on the bowls green, rowers flitting up and down the river, every person smiling, having a good time, forgetting about any of their problems in the outside world. And then the ghosts are gone and the courts sit empty and disused under a smug blue sky. And a second example, similar in length, very different in tone that evokes that kind of imagistic um, scene painting, I've described it. And this is a contributor who is, so she's thrilled at the idea of visiting a supermarket in a different town. Peace Haven Sainsbury's has never been so rich with exotic promise. Um, she says, on the way there, I needed a wee and knowing that the usual options were all closed, I had to be very creative in a built up ribbon suburbia. A closed car sales lot provided adequate cover and again on the way back, albeit in broad daylight. I hope the locals coped with any glimpses of my middle-aged middle arse, white and shining between the polished chrome of auto deals. Returning home, the sun was also ablaze and people exchanged smiles, greetings or just a raised eyebrow. A builder nearly finishing a wall, a chap renewing his fence and a little girl sitting on her scooter who piped a cheerful hello while waiting patiently for her mum to finish on the phone. Okay, so um, to close then after those detailed scene paintings, um, I wanted to provide a few final reflections. While there are photographs included in mass observation diaries, they tend to reiterate COVID's visual repertoire of home baking social distancing signage, isolated urban streets and so on. But um, unlike the hold still and picturing lockdown project, they reflect on them in much greater depth than those contributors were able. Those projects permitted a kind of textual description, but it tended to be short and secondary. Um, mass observation materials are much more rich and effective when they're discussing those photographs. Mass observation illustrations may not have all included visual illustrations, but mass observation writing as a genre lends itself particularly well to visual description. In many cases, it's an imagistic form of writing. Under conditions of lockdown, these qualities are intensified as everyday life is rendered strange, creating new scenes both in the outward world and in the mind's eye. And looking with new eyes from newly isolated perspectives, Perspectives, the writing can become even more ekphrastic. I wanted to close with some final reflections that come from the diarist um, under the number CV1940, who narrates her experience in dialogue with historic plague diaries and literature. On reading about Samuel Pepys's experience of the bubonic plague in the 1660s, where he stated euphorically, I have never lived so merrily as I have done this plague time. She quotes his biographer, Claire Tomlin, who says the parallel is obvious with men and women at war or under bombardment who have found themselves living on an adrenaline high that gives every, it gives extra intensity to every experience. And yet the same 
correspondent quotes from Camus' 1947 novel on how play conditions can become routine and misfortune monotonous. With reference to the visual poverty of material, Camus writes, there is nothing less spectacular than a pestilence. So behind closed doors under lockdown conditions, there was little to see. COVID is invisible to the human eye and for many life became narrow and samey. Despite the heightened senses and vivid dreams, pandemic experience can be hard to articulate and harder to picture. Nonetheless, a powerful desire to see it and to say it runs through mass observation COVID collections whose scaled up submissions are testament to the need to draw a collective portrait in both word and image. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bella. That was fascinating. And thank you for leaving us with so many wonderful images. Um, anyone who hasn't yet had a chance to read Bella's book, Mass Photography, um, I did recently and I really recommend it. Um, Thanks. Let's move on to Kirsty. Kirsty, if you want to share your slides and then we'll have yep. opportunity for questions and discussion um, for all three papers at the end. Bear with. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, it's not starting on the slide, I hoped, but that's fine. <laughs> I'll just go with it for now and see if it rectifies in a moment. Um, that was lovely, Bella, and really, really interesting um, because there's there's so much vivid imagery that came out in the material I was looking at about nature. So this is a slightly, um, might be slightly different paper because I'm speaking in my role managing the mass observation project, but also drawing on some research findings from my MSc at Huddersfield. So I want to give insights to the COVID collection through my research on well-being and nature. I'm going to see if this works. I might have to go to another slide. Okay, bear with. Let me try another PowerPoint. technology. Okay. What you say? Sorry. Bear with me a moment. this so many times. This is where I'm realising I should have shared my presentation with. Okay. Let's see if that works. Oh gosh, bear with. Talk amongst yourselves for a moment. That's all right, Kirsty. Take your time. We've got plenty. Sorry, everyone, I'm just playing with it because it's got some audio on it. So I'm just trying to um, get the right one. Here we are. There you go. Okay, you in? Yeah. Suddenly you can't see me, but <clears throat> that's a bye bye. We'll move on. Okay, so I want to share an extract first. We've been taking different walks locally and started walking around a local park at the start of lockdown to give us a slightly longer walk. We found that our walks were at a similar time to a local group of dog walkers, so we spent the... Oh, sorry. 
Oh, gosh. Last five months greeting them most evenings. We have been spotting more red kites in our area and have enjoyed watching the springtime expansion of the rabbit and rat populations. Being at home so much, we've spent more time in our garden, so I've paid more attention to the goings on there. I put a bird feeder up and I love watching the sparrows, adults and fledglings alike. Okay, so as we've heard, mass observation was in a unique position at the outset of the pandemic. We were able to draw on our national panel of volunteers immediately by sending out um, a letter in the spring, in the March, to just say, start writing, because we don't know what's going to happen and we don't know if we're going to get you some directives. So we're in a unique position to capture material about the COVID and which we have continued to do up until you know, our latest summer directive, which was on testing. So the material documents our observers' emotional responses to these changing events and is particularly strong in female voices. They write openly and candidly in the context of their household, their locality and, and from a UK perspective. But what's important, as we always say, is that with mass observation, people are writing in their own space and in their own time. And as a team, we've spoken considerably about this collection and with Nick and Clive, and we've mentioned it in earlier seminars about the kind of depth and rawness of this material, but how during COVID we were collecting material that was both diary-like in the immediacy of every day and the reflective narratives that came from our directives. And that was very similar to the material that was collected by our founders during World War II. Um, so there's kind of a depth and a rawness to, to the material that was coming through and that's because many, many of our writers are writing for future generations, they're writing for history because we're an archive, but they're also writing because they find the experience therapeutic, they like writing. Um, and as Bella touched upon and, and it came out prolific through, through, my, uh, through this on nature is just the kind of beauty and poeticness that came out with with the writing and the imagery. They also write knowing that their narratives will be used for contemporary research, um, particularly at the moment with the COVID collection. And so those factors are a motivation on why our writers join mass observation, but also how much they share. And I'll touch on the, the kind of relationship we have with them later. Um, so my research was a, a really, um, great opportunity, timely opportunity, to analyse the selection of the COVID collection. And I looked at two time points, so I used the material both thematically and longitudinally, selecting a number of observers over these two time points. Um, and as has been alluded to in, in previous uh, presentations, the wealth of material we have is immense. And even the small amount of writers I looked at, there is, there's so much there. Um, I could talk for hours, so I'm going to briefly touch upon um, what I used, how I analysed it and some of the findings and some and to finally some points to, to think about if you're if you're looking at approaching MO in the future. Just admit that trick. One of the things I really liked was that you could hear more wildlife. It was like they'd all been waiting in the wings. That's one of my favourite quotes. So emerging research showed the significant impact of the pandemic on mental health, not surprisingly, with women likely to fare worse than men. So the value of nature for wellbeing has been well documented over the years, and my research explored the impact on encounters with nature on the mental wellbeing of women, using the theories of attention restoration and connection to nature and well-being, and it's this connection that I'll be looking at today. So I wanted to explore what and how observers were articulating their encounters with nature. So just briefly on connection, um, according to Lumber, while connection to nature is subjective, activities such as contact, emotion, meaning, compassion and beauty are all pathways to improving our connectedness to nature. And connection has been linked to personal well-being and is a predictor of life satisfaction. For Linguli and Lindblom, there's a relationship between connection with the 
the natural world and people's perceived psychological resilience. And this correlates with a study by Samuelson on urban populations in Sweden during COVID and to which I find parallels in the MO material. And proponents of eco-psychology argue that activities which engage urban dwellers with the natural environment, such as the allotment or gardening, increase their feelings of connection to nature. And this came out strongly in the MO narratives. So what I actually looked at was, as I said, two time points. So I was looking at the responses to the special directive that went out in March 2020 and the spring directive. Um, the special, as I said, was just a letter saying just, you know, write. And the spring was a normal formatted um, directive. And then I kind of fast forwarded to the summer period and uh, our directive then, which had, which was on time and had one reference to the kind of rhythms of time and nature. But outside of that, there was no mention of nature in any of the directives. So this was all kind of unprompted. So I was looking at women. I was looking at those who'd responded to either the special and the summer or the spring and the summer or all of them. And I used just the electronic responses like everybody probably has on here because um, we couldn't get into the keep. Um, and as I said earlier, the, the, the special responses are very diary-like. They kind of very much about the pace of events. They talk about, there's lots of comparisons with Europe and also across the UK with Scotland, Wales and England, you know, the different responses, government um, responses to the areas. And because it was kind of day by day and people were writing sometimes morning, afternoon, evening, um, they were detailing the statistics on um, infection rates and death and death rates. So I used a cutoff date because the material was continually coming in and is still continually coming in from those time periods. Um, and I started with 59 observers and 131 narratives. Now, these narratives varied in. They kind of averaged about four sides of A4 but there were some that were like 13 sides. So it was an immense amount of material. So I cut it down to 40 writers using their alphanumerical number. And that gave me um, 97 narratives, which I went through. Now, because of my closeness to the material, working with mass observation all the time and having um, generated the directives, even though when I generated them, I didn't have my research questions on nature in mind, so to aid that, I used um, a form of thematic analysis called template analysis, which has a hierarchical template. And so I used sort of a priori themes from existing literature to build up a sample and then develop that further and applied that to the full uh, 97 narratives. Really, I just want to be by myself and cry. Breathe. People are talking about this situation going on for months. We're on week two and it's already mental. It's a lot, all the time. It's not going away. I keep crying. I can't sleep. I'm sure we've all felt like that. <laughs> so um, the findings showed that women experience varied and fluctuating emotions with low concentration levels and a sense of dread being reoccurring themes throughout the narratives. The longitudinal lens provided insights into the women's reduced well-being as the pandemic events unfolded. So many mentioned seeking counselling come the summertime or being more aware of their increased alcohol intake that had um, progressed. And they describe a weight to their emotions. So for some, this manifested more acutely in the summer and they document being prescribed medication or taking up smoking. And they used words such as shattering and infinitely depressing. And this articulated the heightened emotional states that they were experiencing. The narrative showed psychological impacts compatible with symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder and mental fatigue. And the narratives described a reduced well-being caused by a loss of control over their life. So behaviors, as I've mentioned, such as reduced concentration, irritability and anxiety arose regularly. And there are three areas where this loss of control was um, significant. And that was in changing responsibilities. So the demo, a lot of the demographic of mass observers meant that many who were 
volunteering and active in their community, that completely stopped. And then there were those of working age who were either furloughed or then had to homeschool and had even more increased responsibilities. And then there was the emotional response to processing information. So people talking about this kind of onslaught of news and not knowing how to process that and, and how to deal with that. And obviously the emotional connection to people through the social distancing and isolation. So I looked at their encounters with nature as a means of regaining that sense of control and increasing their resilience during the crisis. So observers reported pursuing new, different or increased outdoor activities in green spaces. They talked about walking, gardening, um, allotment, vegetable growing, and a number of people were producing artwork, collecting materials on their walks or out and about, or taking up art. Um, and their varied encounters with nature locally or privately in gardens were important and they were positive and became a catalyst for regaining this sense of control. So the first was having purpose and routine, as well as actively engaging with nature, observers specified the frequency and regularity of their outdoor activities. And they did this with a purpose which arose from their observations. So uh, move you all so I can actually read the quote. So it says, yesterday it was visit 22 to the pond, the ducks are putting on weight. And walking around the streets more, looking for front garden inspiration. Being forced indoors for the majority of the day, observers reported an impetus to go out daily. Um, as much as that was, you know, dictated by the government that they recommended by the government to do that, there was this impetus and this need to go out for a walk. And for the majority of, of observers, this meant seeking new natural environments to walk. So my partner and I have a daily walk by our local river. We have various places we could walk, but this is the one we usually choose because it's convenient distance and gets us into nature most quickly. So these encounters brought structures to the observer's life, mitigating the loss of control over their changing routines. And I'll show an example of this through one of my case studies. So, which part I've put that up? In spring, G7105 writes about um, her apathy to go out and her fluctuating emotions. She talks of happiness, but then anger and depression. And by summer, this apathy had changed. And she writes, I incorporated exercise into a new routine, going litter picking on a Monday morning with my friend. This is something I look forward to every week as it was contact with someone outside of my home, a nice stroll in the park and a way of giving something back to society. So her interest in repeated visits to the local park was restored through the litter picking activity. And she gained a sense of purpose and routine. And with that a connection, and this increased her mental well-being and evolved into a pro-environmental attitude. So looking both thematically and longitudinally, I was able to identify a number of case studies and trace their journeys over the pan pandemic, looking at how this had, had changed and panned out. So the second area was an escape from the noise and encounters were a refuge from the pandemic. As A7000 wrote, a joy to be in the garden in this lovely weather. The garden is full of birdsong, but the horrors of the world situation are not far from our little sanctuary. And against the repetition of everyday experiences in confined environment, encounters became an escape from these pandemic stresses. They used overwhelmingly positive terms, which I've noted here in the top right. I'm enjoying seeing a greater variety of birds come to my feeding station. And I love hearing woodpeckers when we walk in our local park. So they discovered new areas and they observed changes to familiar environments. They were hearing more birdsong, feeling the sunshine and smelling the flowers. And the narrative's evidence heightened multi-sensory experiences, which Bella alluded to about whether is there more birdsong or am I just hearing this or is it a result of, you know, the lack of traffic that's bringing it here. So this haven was essential to the mental well-being of observers who struggled 
as I said earlier, with the onslaught of pandemic news, and it became a coping mechanism. And the third area was finding new connections. Saw loads of folk and chatted from a safe distance. Observers reported a renewed sense of connection to people, their locality and nature as a direct consequence of their encounters. So meeting new people and saying hello came up quite often. People saying they were meeting regular dog walkers and they'd gone on new routes and this became a new routine for them. For others, it was an, an enabler of reminding them of loved ones. It's blackberry season currently, which always makes me think of my beloved nan and grandpa. We'd take tin cans with string handles and go blackberrying, filling our tins to the brim. So these encounters were enablers of social connections. Their visits to local places became regular and frequent, and what was on their doorstep became of renewed interest, or became new or renewed interest, should I say. And their connection to nature is evidenced in the volume of material and how, how they articulated their encounters. Um, of, of all of the um, initial 59 responses, before I cut down my sample, 58 mentioned nature. Um, and as I said, you know, in the directives, this wasn't asked. So it was just there in their narratives, um, permeating all the way through. So lockdown and the daily exercise measures, the regaining control became looped in what I've pulled together as a kind of virtuous circle extrapolated from Wayman, which is pictured here. You've got those seeking encounters with nature and this in turn enabled them to regain a sense of control, perception or perceived control and feelings of accomplishment and getting out and having that routine and that connection leading to better well-being. And so ultimately, what I was inferring is that these encounters with nature provided a coping mechanism and supported their resilience during this time. There's also a pattern that emerged of epiphany. Covid has invited us to slow down instead of rush around, to sit instead of walk, to listen to the birds instead of shouting over them. So people described how their engagement with nature would not have happened or not have occurred were it not for the pandemic. And the narratives reveal encounters with nature is inviting a reflection whereby the pandemic is no longer solely ne negative, but becomes a positive turning point. And that opens up opportunities and perhaps finding an opportunity in the face of adversity is the ultimate evidence of resilience. So to conclude, I just wanted to again highlight, you know, the unique and valuable source of narrative material and, and particularly this COVID collection, as I said, where it resonates with similarities to the kind of World War II collection where you've got this kind of immediacy of the diary writing coming through over kind of days and weeks, alongside as Perpetua and Rebecca have noted the 12th of May diaries, noting that kind of immediacy in one day, alongside the reflective accounts from the directives. And we have writers who obviously did both. There's a relationship of trust with mass observation in our writers that's been nurtured over many, many years. And that trust is within how we safeguard the material, how we protect their anonymity, and how we make it available for research. And that aids a kind of a depth to the writing. And as I'm hopefully given an example to, the kind of great strength that's there for longitudinal especially again with this COVID collection, because we've had, you know, we had 350 writers on our panel and then in COVID that grew to over 750. So we had new people who joined who've responded to those directives throughout the COVID material. But of course there is that potential to look at those, it's a number of individuals pre-COVID and post-COVID. Um, they're volunteers, so there's always going to be gaps and that can be really frustrating at times, but there's a great opportunity to, to follow that through. There's also, um, there can be gaps in our demographics. So for example, in my research, out of the 40 observers that I was looking at, only three were without a garden. So gathering experiences from those who lived in very urban areas, 
cities or had limited green space, those experiences were scant and that you know, could influence how much they talked about their nature. And until recently, we weren't capturing data on those who consider themselves to have a disability. So in the narratives that I looked at, unless people spoke about that, I wouldn't know whether there was a challenge there in their engagement with, with nature in their ability to get outside into green space. We are now capturing that. We've got new biographical forms that have gone out this year and we are now capturing demographic data on, um, and it's self-defining. So it's sort of free text forms that our observers have written on how they identify with regards to disability, religion, ethnicity, and sexuality. So that information will be there, that metastatum will be there moving forward. Um, and obviously the kind of diversifying our panel and our writing is coming through our education and outreach program, um, which is growing and which I can talk further about another time. But for there, I will, I will leave it.